So we come to the Ecumenical Relations Committee and I call on the convener, Ross Blackman. Moderator, commissioners, friends, uh, Ross Blackman, 220, and convener of the Ecumenical Relations Committee. I hope to keep this short this afternoon and build on the moderator's theme, because we've not just been invited, but we've been reminded that we are building together. Together we're building the future shape of the church. But of course, as the psalmist reminds us, and in fact, his grace reminded us again this morning, Psalm 127, that unless the Lord build the house, the builders labor in vain. We're also reminded that while this is the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, we should never forget that we are only part of the church in Scotland, and part of that far wider church Catholic laboring alongside our Lord Jesus Christ, the master builder, the son of God, but also known as the son of the carpenter. Now, last year, I reminded us that we are not alone. And that comment received a hearty response from representatives of our sister denominations accompanying us on this journey. And we were reminded that we cannot work in isolation, but we look for the future together. And this call, of course, was echoed by the then moderator to remember who you are. Dear Christian, you are a child of God working for the kingdom. This year, we're reminded that we're building together, building not just as congregations within a single denomination, but building the kingdom of God led by Christ and in company with skilled tradespeople from across the denominational spectrum. There are those who are attuned to the spark of the Holy Spirit, our sparkies. There are those whose profession prioritizes water and the sacraments. There are those who deal with gas, lots of gas. There are those who have lots to do with wood and stone, others the airy spaces, those who put roofs above people's heads and food on the tables, as well as those who deal with planning and architecture and landscaping and even demolition. But most importantly, despite our differences and the almost inevitable on-site arguments, we are building together. Paul, of course, used the analogy of needing each other as parts of the body. But for this year, I really would like to stick to that idea of crafts and trades with all of our diversity and specialisms that we bring to the kingdom of God. Now, like the, the moderator, we've changed moderator just for this session, of course, but like uh, moderator Shaw Patterson, like him, I started to work for a wee while in the trades. My father was a carpenter joiner from a long line of builders. And I recall him saying one day that architects make plans, but it's joiners that make them work. We'd built an extension on a house together, myself and my father and my younger brother. And the proposed staircase split on a half landing and then returned into the old house. And then we had an additional staircase we needed to build into the upstairs of the extension. The problem was with how the plans had been left, you'd have had to have, have uh, leant backwards, I've got the name for it now suddenly, uh, you'd have had to limbo underneath the gutter if you wanted to actually get into the new extension of the house. It would have meant walking through the rooms. So we had to adapt it. It was sheer common sense 
that we needed to adapt the plan. And I wonder if how we might better consider the existing roof lines of our ecumenical colleagues. Not that we need to build our own houses, for Jesus himself said, and we recognize the words, that in my Father's house, There are many mansions or rooms, each mansion built upon another and upon another and another as generation after generation extended that single house of our father as an enlarged family to the end that we find ourselves building together and by the grace of God seeing the future shape of the church emerge. On another job, I recall my father saying that half the work in building a house was in the foundation and preparing the ground and knowing what we're building upon. And even Jesus himself alluded to this when talking about building on rock or building on sand. There's the digging. There's the amenities being put in. There's the foundation being laid in the proper dimensions. The initial coursework up to a damp-proof course the solemn and any membranes that are required, all the hard work and graft that goes into getting everything level upon which you can then build a house, and then the real building commences. But all of it thus far went on underground with very little of it visible when it came to observing the final building. When we're building together, It can sometimes be difficult to see any results for a while or just how far we've come. And so your ecumenical relations committee is pleased to remind us that there has been a tremendous amount of work completed alongside the wonderful tradespeople of other denominations and crafts. First and foremost, we build on Christ the Rock. Then the apostles and the prophets with Christ as the chief cornerstone. We have the councils, such as the first council of Nicaea, which led to the Nicene Creed. The St. Andrew's Declaration Group, along with others, would seek to consider considering how we might commemorate next year as a milestone year, 1,700 years after that particular council. We're reminded in our report of our denomination's declaratory act and how the third article declaratory has to be read alongside the seventh article with its ecumenical imperative. We don't have to build alone across the nation because there are already plenty of others throughout the nation with whom to build the kingdom of God. We see the development of the new Scottish Christian Forum, which will continue to evolve. It's a lighter, more flexible and inclusive building together of the future shape of the church here in Scotland. We see renewed work on the Joint Commission on Doctrine in the light of the St. Margaret Declaration. And there are other existing and new friendships that we haven't reported on this year, that we are developing behind the scenes, and that so much foundational work has already been undertaken long before we were working on that, but continuing with ourselves as well, and of which we hope that there may be future declarations. Also, we see the work that we need to undertake with our own new structures and presbyteries and reviewing of plans. And how this also needs work to coordinate with other trades, other denominations, to effect the mission of God. But it would be remiss of me not to take the opportunity to thank so many who have made it possible across the denominations, particularly the ecumenical officers and members of committees, and not least your own committee this afternoon represented, and all the unsung heroes and heroines at grassroots level who labor together tirelessly to build the kingdom of God. As we go forward, what a foundation we do have to build upon as we continue building together 
and see the future shape of the church emerge to the glory of God. Moderator, I was a joiner rather than a gas man. So with these few words, I hope I've hammered a few points home. You can groan at that one. But I'm out of gas and therefore present the report and move the deliverance. Thank you, Ross. We come to questions. I have a question in the name of Paul Middleton. Paul. Uh, thank you, moderator. I thank the convener for an excellent uh, report. Um, uh, my name and number is, is uh, Paul Middleton um, uh, 461 um, and uh, a canon ecumenical of uh, Chester Cathedral. Uh, and on the relationship with the, the Church of England, I, I noticed the excellent work in the, the report that's, uh, that's been, been done, uh, but there seems to be something of a hiatus. So I wonder if the uh, convener could maybe say something about uh, the possible future agenda uh, in talks with the, the Church of England in the Columbia Agreement, uh, and if there are any um, plans for uh, talks on things like uh, doctrine and uh, ministries and the way in which there are with um, other uh, denominations. Thank you. Ross. Certainly, thank you, Paul. Thank you, moderator. Uh, I think it's fair to say that some of the work for the contact group, which we established uh, a few years ago now, when the Columbia Declaration was first uh, instigated, uh, stalled slightly uh, or lost a little bit of momentum, particularly during the COVID years. But there's been a reinvigoration of that. I think it'd be remiss of me to go into details of kind of agendas at this stage and see you nodding your head there as well. Thank you. But, uh, but certainly the work is ongoing and that relationship is continuing not just to be forged, but to be built upon, not just on the basis of that uh, declaration, but, but the continued work and uh, goodwill that there is between to both denominations and other denominations that are, are very interested in that work as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Ross. Two people wanting to comment, but first of all, any further questions to the convener? Okay, I'm going to move on and, and invite Andrew Norman to speak. Andrew is... First of all, we'll receive the report. And now, Andrew, if you're ready, Andrew, thank you very much. Andrew, uh, you'll tell us your name and number, but also perhaps where you're coming from. Uh, it is a delight to have ecumenical partners with us here today. Uh, you enrich us, uh, not just at this assembly, but in our work together um, throughout the whole of the year. So we welcome you, uh, all of you, and we look forward, Andrew, to what you have to say. Thank you. Andrew Norman, 601, Ecumenical Delegate from the Church of England. Moderator, thank you for your welcome and the welcome we've received earlier in the day. The Ecumenical Relations Committee report is not a long report as ecumenical reports go, at least in my experience. <laughs> but as an observer, I'm struck by its remarkable scope. It's all too easy these days for ecumenism to be treated as marginal, relegated to a backwater. Here in this report, we see it right at the heart of what the Church of Scotland, and indeed the Church of England, have as a central concern, the future shape of the church. Here's a quote from it, which I'm sure you are familiar with. There is no future for the Church of Scotland that does not embed cooperative partnership, a great quote. But the report's field of vision extends far beyond even this. As you'd expect, I'm pleased to see that it includes a mention of relations across the border with the Church of England and our Columba Declaration has just been, uh, question, uh, where there's just been a question. But I'm also delighted to see that Europe gets plenty of attention too especially at such a time as this. On a personal note, personal note, speaking of Europe, my own ministry has included a spell at an Anglican chaplaincy in Paris. And I'm pleased to report I experienced cooperative partnership with the Church of Scotland there, with the famous Scots Kirk in Rue Bayard. 
My ministry has also included serving as Archbishop of Canterbury's ecumenical secretary, which included supporting Archbishop Rowan in his engagement with Conference for European Churches General Assemblies. The one I went to was in 2003. But I was touched to see that Rowan's contribution to the latest Keck General Assembly was quoted at some length in this report, a sign of ongoing shared commitment in our churches to Europe, to continental Europe. The practical needs of the, of the church and demands of mission are so pressing that it's all too easy for ecumenism to focus almost exclusively on practical matters, whether locally or further afield. Covering the kind of thing that Cardinal Caspar once called spiritual ecumenism and what the World Council of Churches has called life and work, to the exclusion of faith and order, as if theology, ecclesiology, and the visible unity that Jesus prayed for can quietly be put to one side. Not so in this report. We read about the work with the, the Catholic Bishops Conference and the Joint Commission on Doctrine. And what better way to signal the importance of faith and order than the celebration of the 1700th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea, looking with the World Council of Churches at where now for visible unity. Then finally, in this report's scope, to cap it all, there's the imperative of prayer, seen in the global Thy Kingdom Come initiative we're rallying around as Pentecost approaches. Sisters and brothers, as you focus on building together, I warmly commend this report. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Erica Wishart. Moderator Erica Wishart, 23. I'm the chaplain at St. Columbus Hospice in Edinburgh. I hadn't planned to say anything today, but I've been so inspired by not just everything I've heard up till now about ecumenism, but seeing all the ecumenical delegates Today, I thought that was a really moving uh, time within our General Assembly today. And for me, very inspiring and reminding us that we're part of something so much bigger. And really all I wanted to do is to commend the Ecumenical Relations Committee for their report and just to encourage all of us to embrace ecumenism and to recognize the riches that it can bring into our lives in whatever role we play within the church. Um, I loved the, the phrase, I think it was yourself, Andrew Norman, who said, diversity is our superpower. I think, was that you or was it someone else? Anyway, oh, there's, there's a, there are fingers going over somebody's head. Fantastic, I'm gonna hold on to that. I think that's wonderful. And also, uh, I think it was you, Andrew, who talked about visible unity. And that is certainly something that I hold close in my heart as somebody who uh, found faith within the chaplaincy centre at Edinburgh University, where there were all different Christian denominations, eating together, worshipping together, visible unity. And when I eventually, many, many years later, became a parish minister, ecumenism was, was something that kept me going, really, because I think we all know that parish ministry can be a very lonely place to be. And for me, that peer support actually came predominantly, not only, but predominantly from my colleagues within my own parish in the different denominations. So we had the Pentecostal Church, the African Church, the Roman Catholic Church, um, the Salvation Army, and ourselves, the Church of Scotland, and we would have welcomed really anybody else who wanted to join in. And we had some amazing joint prayer meetings, Bible studies, film nights, social events, all kinds of things. And I, I know from the feedback from people in the community that we showed that visible unity of Christians together. And so that is something that is always... Uh, will forever be a highlight of my parish ministry. And then I thought it was lovely that 
uh, in the letter from His Majesty King Charles, he also encouraged us today to continue to embrace not only ecumenism, but interfaith ministry as well. And as a hospice chaplain, both of those things have come to mean a lot to me. And we are working really hard at St. Columbus Hospice to build uh, our interfaith relationships so that we can support people in our community and within the hospice at end of life in a way that, that has knowledge and understanding of each other's end of life traditions. And so that is a very exciting development for me personally, and I think for all of us uh, within the hospice community. So I just want to finish by reading out a, a comment that really stood out for me in, within the report, and it was reaffirmed, it's at 2.8, and it was reaffirmed at section 14. It says, there is no future for the Church of Scotland that does not embed cooperative partnership as an integral element of its ongoing identity. And I'm just going to leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica. All strength to you in your ministry in the hospice, and thank you for your encouragement to the assembly today. Uh, Leo Cushley, my brother in Christ, Leo has raised a hand, wanting to address us. Leo, introduce yourself, please. 479, uh, Leo Cushley. I'm, I'm here to represent the Bishops' Conference of Scotland, but also um, all of your, your Catholic brothers and sisters in the country who send their, their greetings to you and their prayerful best wishes for your deliberations this week. And greetings from one Lanarkshire laddie to another as well, <laughs> as you take up your, your burden of office moderator. Well done, well done. Um, just a couple of comments um, upon the upon the, the, the deliverance. Um, I'm very pleased to see everything that is there, and I know that um, the, the church that I represent was pleased to, to see that as well. Um, I have, as you know, like, like yourselves, I, I get around, I buzz around lots of places, lots of churches, meet lots of people, and in visiting uh, Catholic churches throughout Scotland, especially my own diocese, which is some 100 plus parishes and churches, I have heard again and again in the last year words of concern and questions to me about what is happening in the Church of Scotland because they are concerned, but in a, in a, in a sort of friendly way, I have to say, um, that they are just a little bit anxious that, that everything is going well or that everything is going to go well because it is clearly something of, of national importance how complex and delicate and difficult it is um, in the in the, the presbytery planning um, and I think we we all have the greatest sympathy for this and I know how difficult it is just to close one or two churches in my own diocese I cannot imagine what it must be like to do that at the national level and so I have noticed this level of of great sympathy and support um, for whatever we can do, I don't know except offer you our, our prayers and our moral support for that. But I think that we, we understand that it is it's something that, that probably probably has to be done. I, I don't want to comment on it too much. It's, it's your question, it's your, it's your affair. Um, but I think that we understand and sympathize with both sides of the argument, the strength of feeling that there is about this and and the natural affection and sentiment that people have for their churches and so on. Um, but I, I don't want to get too carried away with that. I just wanted to point it out to you as, as actually a gesture of sympathy that you might not necessarily always get to hear from your, your fellow Christians in the town or the city that, that you come from. In the report itself, um, I would draw particular attention to the, the Joint Commission uh, for doctrine, uh, which I know that Ross and the committee are, are keen to see reactivated. It, it got a little bit sidetracked. Um, it's a forum for um, dialogue between the, the Catholic Church in Scotland and the, and the Church of Scotland itself, so it's bilateral. Um, but it's been, it's been left in abeyance for a little while, and I'm very pleased to see that that's, it's back on the menu, as it were. Um, now that we have, we have the Declaration of Friendship in place. Um, it's for experts, it's for deep diving. 
they'll be away down there digging and, and looking at things. It could take a long, long time. That's fine. That's what it's for, um, in my view. In the meantime, we are able to continue here at the surface, working together, praying together, and building up um, friendly relations between us all. And I think that is so important. Um, the second point I would make is that great steps have been made in the Scottish Christian Forum, which was largely, broadly, something that was, that was proposed by the Kirk to the other churches here, and which has been embraced by all of us. You see so many of us here. And for, I, for my part, think it works very well indeed. We keep it light. We keep it simple. It's not too ambitious, but it's sufficiently ambitious because it has created a forum where people can come together, pray together, and build up those essential relationships, essential to the rest of what comes after that. Um, and that is, that is much to be commended. Um, so I'm very pleased to be part of that. And the other thing, I, I can't remember if it was in the report now, um, is that we've also been working together on political activity together. And that we have, some of us got together to help second um, Robert, that I see up there in the gallery, to help um, the churches find a better way to dialogue with the politicians of our country, because sometimes we feel that Christianity has ended up on the margins of a country where we are still, if we're not the majority, we're still a significant minority. And we ought to have our voices heard there too. So we've been working on that together. I hope that will bear some fruit. That remains to be seen. But again, very important work. So I would just like to say good things are happening and, and I'm very pleased to support the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. And particularly, I think, for the way in which you express the concern of the Catholic community for uh, the Kirk at this time. Th thank you for that. And uh, there's no one else has requ requested to speak at this point. We have already received... Oh, sorry, we have one more. Apologies. Please come forward. Moderator, members of Assembly, Tara Kalouis, number 600. I want to um, highlight once, firstly, thank you to the Ecumenical Relations Committee for your report. But as the representative here of the World Communion of Reformed Churches, I think there's something additional needs to be commented on. The Communion, the WCRC, very much appreciates the support and the contribution that the Church of Scotland is making to their work, particularly in um, supporting and bringing a refreshed presence and strengthening the witness of the Reformed Churches in Rome. The Church of Scotland um, is supporting that work by providing a mission partner to the congregation, your congregation in Rome, who operates also as the ecumenical liaison person for the Reformed Churches there. So this is a building together partnership, not just between the WCRC and the Church of Scotland. It also includes significant contributions from the Valdensian Church, which this year celebrates 850 years, as well as a minor contribution from the Uniting Church in Australia, because I'm Uniting Church in Australia. So I want to um, affirm and encourage the church on the significance of that partnership. Without your support, this office wouldn't have taken legs like it has in the last 12 months. And so your support is not underestimated. The second comment I'd like to make is relating to the St Margaret's Declaration in the report. In, in March, the International Presbytery met in Rome and they invited a couple of ecumenical speakers to address the Presbytery with greetings. The, one of the speakers was the Reverend Mark Cassidy, Father Mark Cassidy, who is the rector of the Scots, Scots College in Rome. And the main thing he emphasised in the addressing of to the presbytery was the important work 
and the importance of the St Margaret's Declaration. And if you haven't looked at it recently, I strongly encourage you to look at it. After Father Mark left, I said to him, and we're working on this, it would be good for us to do something together to affirm that declaration on St Margaret's Day. And so I encourage you to either look out your local Catholic diocese or your local congregation and work out how you might celebrate that declaration together. Similarly, you could do something around the St Columba Declaration with the Episcopal Church of Scotland. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, Assembly. Thank you. By being here, it's a great example of how we can be working together and ecumenical, ecumenically. Uh, and I look forward to some private conversations where we can hear more and learn more. I can hear more and learn more about the work that you're engaged in. Thank you very much. We now move to section two of the deliverance. Yeah, I've got a comment from, I'll just say, is there any questions in to, to comments? No, so then Andrew Sarrell, please comment. Who are you? Are you? Andrew Sarrell, 236. I'm looking at the wording of the uh, uh, deliverance number two and wonder if the time to reaffirm an ecumenical vision is past. That my wonder is whether the time has come to start looking somewhat more seriously at the ability that the Kirk has to be fully filling what it says in the third article declaratory. And I wonder if we should be looking rather than at reaffirming or strengthening, but actually looking at repealing. Okay. So that's simply a comment. Um, so we've got then section two, the, the assembly. Happy to accept section two. And online, and online, thank you. Section three. And online, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Callum Martin, please. I think we might have phoned past you. That's uh, Callum Martin, Commissioner 039. But that is no problem at all. It was just a comment very briefly in support uh, of, of that point there to instruct the communicators to, to report about the engagement of presbyteries. But I think that the one thing I just wanted to add as a comment was that, first of all, it's, it's really fantastic to see that this process is going so well at both the national and the international level. I think it's a, a really wonderful thing to see this now reaching into presbytery level to really explore the deeper and fuller potentials of what, can, what this can lead to, what this can bring about. And I think the comment I wanted to add was just very simply that at a time when we are rethinking and reforming and reshaping so much of the life of a local church, I just wanted to, to float the idea very gently that perhaps as individual commissioners, as, as individual members of our respective churches, we might find in, in parallel to this process, perhaps informally even, the time and the space to share some of the best examples of things that are already happening across the country. I'm, one of the things that really came to mind through this discussion is just how many friends I can think of in different denominations, in different churches, in different parts of these aisles, where there is such wonderful things going on on, on local level, together of churches of all different denominations, prayer meetings, coffee mornings, different approaches, different environmental initiatives, and I just think if there were some kind of way that we could informally have it in mind that actually we have all these stories really coming together, welling up in support of what these processes are going, welling up to kind of really show that these declarations have real power and real meaning, that we may come from many different homes, many different churches, we might speak and pray in different voices or different languages, but we are all still seeking to know the same shepherd. And there are so many opportunities for us to continue to, to build on what's happening, both nationally and locally, together as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Right, 
section four. Now, I've got notice of a question and a comment in section four. So, um, in terms of a question, Innes Duncan. Innes Duncan, 30. Moderator, I'd like to ask the convener, uh, as they hinted in section 7.2, there were some problems with the winding up of acts and, and the establishment of the Scottish Christian Forum. And I wonder if you're is in a position to elaborate on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. I appreciate the, que the question. Um, trouble in, in winding up of acts. I think the reality is things take time to do so. The COVID years have intervened as well, of course. Uh, you'll see from our report this year that we, we talk about some of the progress that's happened there and some of the milestone years where the Assembly has, has considered just how that ecumenical landscape uh, might continue to develop and what's been happening with the SCN as well. And the SCN itself has taken quite a while to negotiate Again, in that context of um, not just, just ecumenism, but particularly the COVID years. So I, I guess in answer to that, it's been slower progress than hoped, but we, but we seem to be slowly but surely getting there. Um, but what's of, of quite joy to be able to repeat is that the, the Scottish Christian Network, which is including an in, um, a widened number and a more inclusive number of denominations really seems to be getting some wind in its sails. Of course, it's got to evolve further. There is, there is significant work further to do, uh, as is ever the case, but we're, we're really encouraged by progress to date. Thank you. And a comment by Max Leaney. Was the pudding lovely? Because I had to leave before you got into the pudding earlier. I, I wanted to bring you yours, but they wouldn't let me. Did you have it? <laughs> Mark Slaney, number 487, uh, Chair of the Methodist Church in Scotland. I bring you the greetings of the Methodist people and congratulations on your appointment. Thank sure. you. Uh, and I'm also the convener of the Scottish Church Leaders Forum. Uh, thank you, Ross, for your presentation of the report. Joiner Ross, I thought you nailed it. Well done. <laughs> oh, oh, no, it's better than that. Better than that. Uh -huh. <laughs> About a week ago, my wife and I uh, rode the uh, Caledonia of Tap. We cycled out of Pitlochry and along Loch Rannoch and then up and over and down to, uh, not Loch Rannoch, Loch Tummel, isn't it, first, and then up and over and down to Kinloch Rannoch, up and over the Shehalian Road, along the delightfully named Appin of Dull, <laughs> and then turning left at Logie Rate and up and over to Pitlochry again. Uh, about 2,000 feet of ascent on a bicycle. My wife, a former uh, amateur triathlete, rides a very light racing road bike. And on the hills, she can disappear and go out of my sight. I ride a heavier, uh, slightly fatter, tired, slightly fatter, tired rider. <laughs> and that means on the downhills, I can catch her up. And on occasion, go out of sight. Uh, but we chose almost the whole way to ride side by side. Very rarely were we not able to do that, so we crossed the finish line together, which was great. Riders, not racers. Uh, I think the form that you have before you proposed uh, for the National Ecumenical Instrument, the Scottish Christian Forum, with the Scottish Church Leaders Forum and the Scottish Ecumenical Officers Forum, enables us, it is effectively, after a lot of hard work, the agreed common pace of travel so that we stay side by side. Um, when are the first, last, and the last first when they cross the finish line together? And, and that's one of the reasons why I want to commend it to you and encourage you uh, to approve it as your Methodist brothers, sisters, and siblings have done at their synods in Scotland. Um, in the Scottish Church Leaders Forum, uh, this simpler uh, relational participatory form, which uh, Leo spoke of, brings together at the moment 15 representatives from churches and various church networks across Scotland. Uh, it's not a competition, but that's double the number plus one um, that ACTS manages to, has, has managed to represent. The simpler form uh, is drawing more people in. It, uh, it appears. Certainly that is our experience at this point in time. We're not talking about a couple of riders here. It is a peloton. It is a peloton. Mm. Um, so I wanted to point that out and to encourage you 
um, commend to you the form uh, and your approval of it. I'd be enormously grateful. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Right, section four. And online. Okay, and online. Section five. Okay, and we have a new section six in the name of Dr. Grant Barclay. Where are you? Grant Barclay, 163. Moderator, just a few Fridays ago, I was privileged, along with hundreds of others at St. Andrew's Metropolitan Cathedral in Glasgow, to hear Father Gabriel Romanelli speak. I was at a Mass for Peace there, and Father Gabriel who is the Catholic parish priest of Gaza, described the present conditions for his small flock and for the whole population who used to live in an open prison and who now inhabit an open sewer and wasteland. He spoke with compassion and with grace about Israelis still held hostage and families mourning loved ones lost in the October attack by Hamas. He spoke, too, about more than 35,000 people, and among them too many women and children, killed in Israeli bombardment and gunfire. Father Gabriel spoke with clarity and with faith, and he said two things. One, that Gaza is almost a hell, and two, that Jesus is there. Denominational difference melted away in the cathedral in the light of his words as he described such suffering by so many in different ways. And I want in moving this section of the report only to touch on the issue, hoping that later in the assembly there might be opportunity for further conversation, but rather to think about administration because you say, it would have been so easy for us, moderator, in our congregations and in Glasgow Presbytery, caught up as we are in the routines of work and in the challenges which Archbishop Cushley mentioned of mission planning, to have missed what Justice and Peace Scotland and SCIAF were doing. And we were able, as fellow Christians, to take part because of the ecumenical ties we enjoy in Glasgow and the work of the Secretary of Glasgow Churches together, Elspeth Glasgow, and the work of our church's ecumenical officer, John McPake. They, together with the Catholic Archdiocese, Justice and Peace and SCIAF, helped make and publicise arrangements so that people from all denominations might stand together in shared concern and prayer. It was to that gathering of a people of God together that the priest to the Gazan Christians urged us and the world to do everything we can to end this awful suffering and so to bring hope to all the people of Gaza and the whole troubled region. And it is in grateful recognition of this generous planning that I move this new section for which I've arranged a seconder. We are enriched moderator. When different denominations can build together and can share in learning, in worship, and in a common witness, pleading for peace. Thank you. Well, thank you, Greg. <laughs> Do we have a seconder? Okay, I'm getting a signal that the convener's happy to accept. Would the assembly be happy to accept this new number? Anderson, first of all, for a comment. Um, moderator Lindsay Sanderson, 486. My comment doesn't relate specifically to this section, but to the additional section six that has been put, I think, in the name of Dr. Hamilton. Uh, you give us a wee second or two? Yep, certainly. Please, thank you. And Andrew Swift, then. 
Oh, so by approving it, I was actually on the schedule by, the by accident. Did, how did you do it with video? All right, so assembly then happy to, to agree the new section six in Grant Barclay's name and online. Okay, on agreed. And we've got another, don't worry about the numbering, they'll sort it out later. Uh, we've got another <laughs> new section um, six uh, who's coming in the name of Alan Hamilton. Moderator, thank you. Uh, the motion is on the screen. It is uh, pretty straightforward, commends the work that's being done and instructs the committee to ensure that it's engaging with uh, uh, all churches. Um, and uh, I'm assured that that's what's happening. Uh, I'm assured um, that the committee is more than happy to report uh, appropriately on, on what it is doing. And I, I understand that the convener is content to accept this, and therefore I have nothing more I need to add. Okay. Is it seconded? Okay, seconded. And Lindsay, second time round. Thank you, moderator. Lindsay Sanderson, number 486. Moderator, I welcome this addition to the deliverance and would like to take this opportunity to reassure the Assembly that indeed the Church of Scotland is continuing in dialogue and cooperation with churches in Scotland and beyond who are not specifically named in the deliverance as initially issued. In my four months as moderator of the National Synod of Scotland of the United Reformed Church, I have been pleased to respond to the request from a number of presbytery clerks to meet and have conversation around the situation specifically of local ecumenical partnerships where both the Church of Scotland and United Reformed Church are in membership within the presbytery mission planning process. And these have been fruitful conversations. I'm also grateful for the invitation from the principal clerk to initiate a conversation between our two churches about developing our relationships further. As is alluded to in the report of the Ecumenical Relations Committee, in 1973, the Church of Scotland, together with the United Reformed Church and the United Free Church of Scotland, were signatories to the Leuenberg Agreement, meaning that we committed to and agreed to full communion between our churches. The Methodist Church became a later signatory. That agreement means we are already in the fullest possible agreement. It seems to me that the challenge and opportunity 50 years on is to ask what full communion looks like for today's church in today's context. I am minded of the wisdom offered by the Australian Church's Covenanting Together process, which states, if we go to the limit of what is already possible, we will discover we are in a very different place. It must be a matter of confession that in our relationships with one another, we have largely stayed within our comfort zones and failed to live in that liminal space. If we are to truly build together, seeking the unity that Christ wills for the church so that the world may believe. I believe we must have courage, determination, and faith to make our way to the limits of what is already possible. And that is what I believe this deliverance as a whole and this addition intends. Moderator, it is my hope that the assembly accepts this addition to the deliverance that it holds in its prayers those entrusted with journeying to the liminal space. And I look forward to being back in this hall next year to discover where the Spirit has led us in this process of building together in the service of the kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Swift. 
Uh, moderator, um, Andrew Swift, number 488, um, Scottish Episcopal Church. And, uh, and I bring the greetings of the Scottish Episcopal Church to the, the whole of the assembly. It's a, a joy to be with you. Um, I was last with you as a, an ecumenical representative five years ago. And uh, you've had a wee bit of change since then, <laughs> maybe. Um, I think you had 42 presbyteries, and no one had heard of Zoom back then. So lots of things are, <laughs> are clearly changing. Um, to be an ecumenical representative at a, a time of great change, um, I would share exactly what Archbishop Leo said. Our churches are, are anxious for you and worried about you and how you are. Uh, we have our, our own issues with clergy well-being and sustainability and how ministry is funded. And these are hard places to be. And it's all too easy to, to crowd ecumenical relations out when you're grappling with these sorts of um, really hard existential issues. So please do be assured we want to be a partner. We want to be a, a sister church here in Scotland with all of you at the, the national, presbytery, diocese, local level. Um, we want to be here with you, journeying with you. And we're doing some work in a few weeks on our canons, our legislation, and um, I think it'll pass, um, where we've had some quite testy conversations about offering services in buildings of other denominations and not being in full communion, but saying that um, we believe the, the sacraments are faithfully administered in each other's churches. That's what our St. Andrew's Declaration says. That's an enormous thing to say after so many years of history. So we're doing the, the legislation, we're doing that work. But my plea, and why I'm really keen to comment and encourage this edition, is to make sure that we actually do it. Out there in the, in the bustle of change, of reform, of all these pieces of turbulence and trauma that we can go through as churches, let's find a way to, to work together. Now, I was never a joiner, Ross, but once upon a time, I've talked to Weld, so I could extend the analogy. If we can draw ourselves together, weld ourselves together, where we can work. Sparks may fly. That will often happen. Thank you. But my prayer for you is we will pass this deliverance, this additional motion, and the business this week will encourage, build up, and bless you all. So, moderator, thank you. Thank you. Are you happy to? Thank you, moderator. Uh, as with the previous additional deliverance from Dr. Barclay, um, I, there's very little I really want to add because it's so eloquently been expressed by others. I'm not a gas man, as I say, I'm a joiner. Um, but it, it really was appreciated to, to hear those endorsements of it. When I first saw the, the suggestion from uh, the good doctor about adding this particular one, I thought, well, you know, 2025, we're kind of the things there we're already doing. But to be honest with you, I'd be delighted for us to regularly be able to report as the good news stories, as we also heard from somebody else, uh, on a regular basis of the kind of work that's continuing to go on uh, between our various denominations at grassroots level and uh, all through our various structures as well. These are good things to be able to report. We don't want to hide them in the foundations under the solemn. We want to get them uh, seen and appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. So, the Assembly prepared to accept this new number six. Thank you. And online. Right. Thank you very much. And we have then section seven. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> section six in the print. Six, six, six is maybe not a number of moderators, should we say, <laughs> in the floor of the Assembly. We've got three sixes. So, the third of the sixes. You knew you were going to get that. You know, that was... <laughs> uh, so we have the original six in the print. Agreed. And online. Right, thank you. Now can we move to section seven uh, as in the print? And these all have consecutive numbers uh, in the minute. Is that agreed by assembly? And online. And the deliverance as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you. 